Hey friends, thanks for joining me for this video where I'm going to break down and explain redox reactions, which are also known as oxidation reduction reactions. Now we're going to look at some common questions I hear all the time. How do I recognize a redox reaction when I see one? What am I supposed to use oxidation numbers for and how are they calculated? And of course, we'll look at some common questions that pop up on tests and quizzes so that you're ready to answer them. Thanks for joining me. Please like the video and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already and get ready to learn. What's up everybody? Welcome to Neil's not so boring world of chemistry. Let's go into the lab and take a deep look. All right, so I think a great place for us to begin in understanding redox reactions is to simply look at some examples. The three chemical equations you see on the board behind me are all classified as oxidation reduction reactions. Take a look at them with me. Do you see anything obvious that connects these three reactions to one another? Yeah, I don't either. They look pretty different. Okay, myth number one that we're gonna dispel is that redox reactions, because the ox comes from oxidation, always involve the element oxygen. As you can see, only one of these three reactions has oxygen as a player. Another big misconception is that redox reactions always involve metals, and that's probably because metallic substances like nails forming rust is an example of oxidation but by no means are metals always involved. As you can see, only two out of these three reactions have a metallic element. So redox reactions don't require oxygen and they don't require metals. So what are they? All right, so it turns out there's only one single event that has to occur in order for a reaction to be labeled or classified as a redox. And that event is the simple transfer of electrons from one atom to another. For example, let's say we have an iron atom that's about to react with this oxygen atom. If in the process of reacting, this iron atom loses an electron to the oxygen, we would say that the iron has been oxidized. Oxidation is the loss of electrons. On the other hand, as that electron was taken by this oxygen atom, it was reduced. So the oxygen was reduced, and reduction is gaining electrons. So once again, we've got an electron being lost by the iron, which is oxidized, and gained by the oxygen, which is reduced. And it's that simple process that classifies all the reactions we just looked at as being redox. What we learned in the last segment can be summarized by remembering these helpful mnemonic devices. The phrase Leo the lion says grr has the word Leo, which can be used to remember that losing electrons is oxidation, and the word grr, which can be used to recall that gaining electrons is reduction. Alternatively, some students like to use oil rig. Oil stands for oxidation is loss, and the word rig stands for reduction is gain. So we just learned a simple concept, which is that in order for a reaction to be considered redox, one condition has to be met. Electrons have to be transferred from one atom to another. And we said the atom that loses electrons has been oxidized, while the element that took them away has been reduced. Now, of course, those two things always have to happen together. So no one's going to be oxidized unless something else is reduced and vice versa. But I can remember understanding that as a concept, and yet as a student looking at chemical equations like this and wondering, how am I supposed to know where the electrons are and what they're doing? I mean, all I see is a bunch of letters and numbers, right? So now I want you to come with me, and we're going to take a closer look at a concept called oxidation numbers. And this is essentially a way for students and chemists to do some record keeping. We're going to learn how to tell how many electrons every atom in this equation has and whether that number changed from the reaction side to the product side. And if it did, we've got a redox reaction.
All right, so to find the oxidation number of any element in a chemical equation, we're gonna to have to use these oxidation rules. Now you're gonna to need to commit these to memory because they're generally not provided to students on exams. I would pause the video here and write down these four rules in your notes. Now we're gonna go through them one by one, but before we do, I wanna give you a more general sense of how they're used. For example, let's take a look at this combustion reaction. If I was asked whether or not it was redox, here's what I would do. I would use the rules to assign each atom an oxidation number. Then I would compare each atom's oxidation number as a reactant versus its oxidation number as a product. If any element has experienced the change in oxidation number, this is a redox reaction. Now, more specifically, if an element's oxidation number has increased, we say it's been oxidized. So maybe its oxidation state went from zero as a reactant to plus one as a product. On the other hand, if an element's oxidation number has decreased, we say it's been reduced. So maybe as a reactant, it was plus two, and maybe as a product, it was plus one. Now remember, oxidation and reduction always occur together. Okay, let's get back to those rules. The first one says the oxidation number of any uncombined element is zero. So anytime you have an element in a chemical equation that's by itself, not in a compound, like O2 or Fe, you can assume that its oxidation state is zero. And that basically just means that it has the same number of protons and electrons. Okay, let's go to oxidation rule number two. If you have an ionic compound in your equation, you should separate it into its respective ions. And the oxidation number of the ion is the same as its charge. So for aluminum sulfide, I break up the ions. I see aluminum is three plus, so its oxidation number is plus three. And the sulfur is minus two, so its oxidation number is minus two as well. All right, rule number three. Now we're gonna use some algebra. The sum of the oxidation numbers of all the atoms in a molecule or polyatomic ion must equal its overall charge. So for example, take a look at the phosphate polyatomic ion. Because its charge is three minus, when I add up all of the oxidation numbers of the phosphorus and the four oxygens, the sum must be negative three. Now I use X to represent the oxidation state of phosphorus because I don't know what it is. You'll see in rule, rule number four that we can assume oxygen to have an oxidation state of negative two. And I'm multiplying that by four because there are four oxygens. Now I just solve for X and I find that phosphorus has an oxidation number of positive five. On the right hand side, we have C2H6. Now the big difference here is that I set the algebraic expression equal to zero. Why? Because C2H6 doesn't have a charge. I multiply the X, which represents the oxidation number of carbon by two, because there's two carbons. Hydrogen has an oxidation number of plus one almost all the time. Again, you'll see that in rule number four. And I'm multiplying that by six because there's six hydrogens. Solving for X, I find that the oxidation state of carbon is negative three. Okay, for rule number four, we see here that there are three elements in particular that are very consistent in terms of their oxidation states. Most of the time, fluorine will be negative one, oxygen will be negative two, and hydrogen will be positive one. Okay, let's go back to that combustion reaction. So using the rules we just went over, I was able to determine the oxidation numbers of all the atoms in the equation. Now, of course, hydrogen and oxygen, I labeled those as plus one and zero because of rule number four. In order to find out carbon's oxidation state, I had to use rule number three, which is the algebraic approach. Notice that I set CH4's oxidation numbers equal to zero because the molecule doesn't have a charge and neither does the carbon dioxide. I used X to represent the oxidation number of carbon because I don't have a rule for carbon specifically. And I found that carbon's oxidation state went from negative four as a reactant to positive four as a product. This means we have a redox reaction. So specifically, the carbon was oxidized. Losing electrons is oxidation, as you'll remember. And when you lose electrons, your oxidation state becomes more positive. Now the oxygen is what was reduced. Remember, gaining electrons is reduction. When you gain electrons, your oxidation number is going to become more negative because electrons have a negative charge. And here we see the oxygen went from zero to negative two. So that's a quick overview of how we use oxidation numbers 
to determine with confidence whether a reaction is redox or not. Okay, now we're ready to do an example together. This is a double replacement reaction, and all students are taught that these types of reactions are never redox. But why? In a question, you'll probably be asked to provide evidence to support that claim, and you'll need oxidation numbers to do it. So let's figure this out together. Now we're gonna have to remember that for things like hydrogen and oxygen, we have rules that tell us what their oxidation states will probably be. Hydrogen is usually plus one, oxygen is usually minus two. But when it comes to elements like barium, nitrogen, or sulfur, we're gonna to have to think a little bit more deeply about it. Now for any ionic compound like a barium nitrate or a barium sulfate, we can split it up into its respective ions. When we do that, we see that the barium has a charge of plus two. So its oxidation state will be plus two. Nitrate is a polyatomic ion, and it has a molecule has a charge of negative one. Well, there's a rule that says for any molecule or compound, its overall charge must be equal to the sum of the oxidation numbers. So I'm going to set up an algebraic expression. X is used to represent the oxidation number of nitrogen, which I don't know. Then I have a negative 2 for oxygen's oxidation number. And the 3 is because there are three oxygens in this particular molecule. And of course, all that added together must equal negative 1. Here's our simplified equation, and when we solve for x, we find it to be plus 5. So nitrogen has an oxidation state of plus 5. Let's go over to the sulfuric acid. Now here, hydrogen has a state of plus 1, oxygen has a state of minus 2, but again, we don't know what sulfur state is. We're going to use the algebraic approach. This entire molecule has no charge, so the sum of these oxidation numbers must equal 0. Now, here's the plus one from hydrogen, and there's two hydrogens in the formula. There's only one sulfur, so I'm gonna represent that just as X. And the negative two comes from the oxygen, and of course, there's four of those in the molecule. Solving for X, I find that its value is plus six. So sulfur has an oxidation state of plus six. Now we have another strong acid, nitric acid. Now again, we have hydrogen and oxygen, and we know their oxidation states with confidence. But nitrogen, I'm not so sure. Now again, this is a neutral molecule, so I set everything equal to zero. Here I have to remember that this coefficient of two means there's two hydrogens, two nitrogens, and two times three, or six, oxygens. Simplifying that, I get two plus two x plus negative 12 equals zero. X must be positive five. That's the oxidation state of the nitrogen. Okay, lastly, we have one more ionic compound, so we split it apart. Barium, again, has a charge of 2+, plus, so its oxidation state is plus 2. Sulfate is a polyatomic ion with a negative 2 charge, so when we set up our algebraic expression, it must be equal to negative 2. Now, there are four oxygens, which is why I'm multiplying the negative 2 times 4, and the x is there to represent the sulfur. x plus negative 8 equals negative 2. Sulfur's oxidation state is plus six. Okay, now take a step back. Compare the oxidation numbers of the elements on the left side of the arrow to those on the right side of the arrow. Have any oxidation numbers changed? The answer is no. In double replacement reactions, there is generally no transfer of electrons. Nothing is oxidized, nothing is reduced, and that's why these reactions are not redox. Before we look at some practice questions together, let's go over the major ideas that were presented in this video. Firstly, we established that a redox reaction will always feature an exchange of electrons. These are some helpful mnemonic devices we can use to differentiate between the meaning of oxidation and reduction. Now, in order to be certain that a reaction is redox, we're gonna to wanna to calculate oxidation numbers for every atom in the reaction and look for changes. Here are the four simple rules we can follow to do that. It turns out that several reaction types fall under the umbrella of redox. Those are synthesis, decomposition, single replacement, and combustion. On the other hand, we looked at an example and proved that a double replacement reaction will never be redox. Practice question number one.
please read the question, pause the video, think about an answer, and then unpause the video to see the solution. What is the oxidation number of the nitrogen atom in N2O4? Practice question number two. Does the equation below represent a redox reaction? Please identify any atoms that are oxidized or reduced. Yes, this is a redox reaction. We know this because calcium is reduced as its oxidation number decreased from positive two to zero. On the other hand, nitrogen was oxidized. Its oxidation number increases from negative three to zero. Thank you so much for watching this video and supporting the channel. I would love to hear your comments and questions, so if you leave them below, I'll be sure to get back to you soon.